One of the best articles I've read on patient experience recently was one by Susan Shale in Clinical Governance, an international journal. And she talked about these three domains of patient experience. First of all, there was the biological dysfunction, so the disease and the symptoms itself. Secondly, there was the satisfaction I have as a customer with my provider. And this is kind of where the fran friends and family test comes in. The third element of patient experience is the one that I want to focus on in my talk. It's the totality of living with health, illness and treatment. Everything all together as it happens in my life. You spend a lot of time waiting around in waiting rooms as a patient and that gives you an enormous opportunity to observe exactly how the system works or doesn't work for all the different patients. And although professionals gain their knowledge and experience through a very acknowledged, formal, regulated structure through the formal education system, getting lots of formal qualifications, the experience I've had as a patient, I've, and many other patients, I think are probably on track to get a first from the University of Life. And what I want to try and argue over the next couple of minutes is that if we want to have uh, the journeys that patients take through our services to be as complete as possible, then both of these experiences are equally valid, no matter how they've gained. I just want to sort of ask a bit of a rhetorical question in terms of, as the NHS, are we making the most out of all of the experiences that our patients are getting through the University of Life? If we want to be designing a complete pathway through the NHS, we need to have all of that clinical input from fantastic clinicians and service managers, but also that expertise and knowledge that comes from people who tread perhaps a slightly different path. So to take a standard um, journey through the NHS, as well as all of the standard appointments and treatments and medications um, that are documented, there's also this whole extra side that really adds up to the patient experience, and that's the side that I don't think um, clinicians and managers necessarily get to see, because it's what patients do themselves. And even when I'm not sat at my consultant's desk or I'm not having a physiotherapy appointment, I'm still a patient. I'm a patient 24-7, so the activities I do by myself are just as much part of my patient experience as when I'm having an appointment with my doctor. So first of all, there's all the medications I have to manage, the day daily physio exercises, managing all the different symptoms that you face on a day-to-day -day basis, and preparing for the next appointment, and also recovering from the aftermath of an appointment as well. And possibly even more hidden from that, which is, is quite a medical aspect of being a patient, is the more psychological and emotional aspect of it. So for me, anxiety about test results and fear for the future. And although my um, physical health conditions are neurological and have got a very, very clear physical cause, one of the most crippling symptoms and impacts it's had on me has been the depression. And that's been far more um, crippling and debilitating than temporary paralysis because it's not something that's seen and it's something which affects me 24-7. And finally, the social impact of being a patient. So trying to maintain some sort of career and a family life, friends, hobbies, and a lifestyle. So some sort of normality despite having an illness. And that all sort of comes under self-management for me. And that really is beyond just who you're being referred to and trying to regain some sort of sense of quality of life in between those appointments. There's been a new self-management service set up in Dorset to support people with long-term health conditions to improve the quality of their life and gain confidence um, in their experience of managing their own health condition. And we had some very interesting um, conversations um, as part of the patient group when this service was being set up a couple of months ago. And we looked at the emotions that people would feel as they went through the service. And so we thought about, well, people um, first ring up the service. I wonder what we would feel like when we did that. Or when I first met my health coach to have my self-management support, how would I feel then? Or how would I feel when I'd finished my course and I was sort of discharged formally from the service? And what came out of the conversations that we had um, as a patient group was that although those individual touch points were important and there were a lot of emotions related to making the first call or finally leaving the service, 
the emotions that people talked about weren't the particular transitions. It was the whole journey that they were embarking on in embracing self-management. Within our patient group, the word strategies didn't really mean anything, and the word barriers didn't really mean anything, and self-management didn't really mean anything. So we had to frame exactly what the service meant in terms of outcomes for them as individuals. So would it help them to gain confidence? Would it help them to find support services, to find relevant information, and to make lifestyle choices? And suddenly, having framed the language around outcomes which mean something to patients rather than meaning something to managers and commissioners, people will hopefully be more interested in engaging with the service <coughs> because they're going to have an experience which resonates with them. So when we talk about there being 15 million people living with long-term health conditions, I'd like to see if we could rephrase that as 15 million people with insights into how the NHS works, 15 million people who've got skills in how they manage their own health condition and skills in managing change and everything else you have to do as professionals. So that could actually be turned around to be 15 million partners in improving care.